be discussing the United States economic performance over the course of the of this year, 2023, as it comes to an end. I've been collaborating with John Greenwood on most of this research. Uh, how do, how were we able to hit the bullseye on where inflation was going when it went up, and also when it's coming down? And and to do that, we use the tried and true method, the quantity theory of money. It's it's been it's been around since the 16th century, used by virtually virtually all all economists, except rather recently. I would say in the last 30 years, it's it's kind of died away, and and the central bank pays in the United States as well as the United Kingdom and the European uh, Central Bank. They they pay absolutely no attention to the quantity theory of money. Now, what is that? In simple terms, it, it's the, the changes in the money supply are what provide the fuel for the economy. Hello, everyone. My name is Nori Zwana, and I'm an economist with the World Bank. I'll be hosting today's program on New Wave Global, in which we will be discussing the United States economic performance over the course of, the, of this year, 2023, as it comes to an end. And more importantly, we will be discussing as to what should be expected in the next year, 2024. And in joining me here, I would like to introduce a very special guest. Uh, with me, I have Professor Steve Hankey, who is the Professor of Applied Economics and also the founder and co-director of the Institute of Applied Economics at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Professor Hankey is a world-renowned economist who served as a senior economist during President Reagan's administration. He's also served as an advisor to various other U.S. administrations and to other various countries around the world. He was the advisor to the president of Bulgaria, Venezuela, and Indonesia, and has also helped establish currency regimes in various countries across South America and Eastern Europe. So um, arguably, I don't think there's anyone better who has command over the topics related to currency inflation. And it's an absolute honor to have him here today. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Good to be with you. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot for us to learn from you and to kind of uh, learn more about what is likely to happen. So let me uh, begin this by setting the ground Ever since COVID happened, we've seen that the U.S. economy has been navigating through some tricky waters. And not to mention that U.S. is the world's largest economy. It is the second largest country in terms of contribution to global trade right behind China. And therefore, whatever happens to the U.S. economy or what happens in the U.S. economy has direct and indirect impacts for majority countries around the world. So it's very important and keen to see, understand what is happening, what is shaping the U.S. economy. And ever since COVID happened, we've seen that the private sector was hugely impacted. There were business closures, there were supply chain disruptions, there were layoffs, and uh, people really felt the brunt of it. According to Gallup's measure of economic confidence, uh, ever since COVID happened, every month it has been in red, highlighting the fact that people have not really uh, reflected confidence in the economy. And in order to address these, these problems, the U.S. government, the administration, the Fed, they employed a number of policy levers. First, they you know, really boosted, aggravated the money supply, the M2, which went to an all-time high of 26.2% in Feb 2021, as a result of which uh, inflation hit an all-time, you know, a 40-year high of 9.1%, which you had actually even uh, predicted before it happened. Um, in order to address inflation, the Fed then started raising the interest rates. Uh, the interest rates uh, hiked to a 22-year high. Uh, they are at 5.5% now. And the purpose was to kind of curb aggregate demand, you know, address inflation. And now we've seen that recently the CPI, the inflation uh, as it is measured, is down to 3.1%, which again, you had predicted before it happened. Now, the question for me, for you first, is that what does this all mean? The interest rates are high, the inflation is coming down. Were the measures that were employed over the course of this year and the previous two years, were they the right steps? Uh, that's part A. And the next question is, how do you envision things unfolding going into the next year in terms of uh, growth, in terms of inflation, um, and in terms of the, the interest rates as well? 
Okay, that that's a very good summary and introduction. Uh, and and the, the, the question that really uh, arises out of that introduction is how did how did John Greenwood and I, because I've been collaborating with John Greenwood on most of this research, uh, how do, how were we able to hit the bullseye on where inflation was going when it went up and also when it's coming down? And and to do that, we used the tried and true method, the quantity theory of money. It's it's been it's been around since the 16th century, used by virtually all, all economists, except rather recently, I would say in the last 30 years, it's it's kind of died away. And, and the central bank pays in the United States, as well as the United Kingdom and the European uh, Central Bank, they, they pay absolutely no attention to the quantity theory of money. Now, what is that? In simple terms, it, it's the, the changes in the money supply are what provide the fuel for the economy. So if the money supply is going up, the, the fuel's going up, economic activity goes up. And when I say economic activity goes up, that's nominal GDP. That's real GDP plus the inflation rate. That's nominal GDP, that, that goes up. And if, if the money supply starts contracting, nominal GDP goes down. And I, I've just completed and published about a month ago in the journal World Economics, a, an article in which I looked at 147 countries from 1990 until 2021. That was the time period I looked. And I looked at the changes in the money supply in those countries and the changes in the price level. And, and, the, and, and what was the correlation? The correlation was 0.96, almost a one-to-one -one relationship. You change the money supply, and that changes the prices. So, so that's what's driving the the, the that, that that's in, in short that's my model for nominal uh, for for national income determination, for national income determination, meaning where is nominal GDP going? That's the model. And, and that is a reliable model. Now, that that worked in the past. And as I say, if you look, I look, just looked at 147 countries over a long period of time from 1990 to 2021, and, and, and it worked there. So it works. But most central bankers are, aren't looking at that. With the exception, I gave you the United States, big country, European Union, ECB, big, yeah. UK, important. But some some countries, particularly those in Southeast Asia, are actually do pay attention to the money supply. If you look at India, it's behaved pretty well. You look at Indonesia, Indonesia, they're they're hitting what I call Hanky's golden growth rate. They're growing the money supply at a rate that's consistent with hitting whatever their inflation target is. China has been has been pretty good. So China, huge economy, of course, and, and, and it's doing pretty well and paying attention to the money supply. So so that's that's kind of the background. Now, the, the important thing, you mentioned interest rates, and to paraphrase Milton Friedman, who was a big champion of the quantity theory of money, Nobel laureate in economics, of course, and, and my, one of my mentors, Friedman said, monetary policy is not about interest rates, it's about the changes in the money supply. So you gotta keep, you gotta look at the money supply. Now, if we look at the money supply and what's happened, you indicated that it, it had soared up in 2021, it went up over, it was yeah. almost 27%. Which, by the way, the golden growth rate in the United States for the growth in the money supply measured by M2, it, it, it's consistent with hitting an inflation target of 2%, which is the Fed's inflation target. That It's about 6%. So, so it, it soared up way above the gold. Four times rate. more than what it should have been. Absolutely. And, and now, where is it? It, it's come down and it's been contracting for over a year 
since March, actually, of 2022, the money supply has contracted by four and a half percent. Now, now that's that's not that's almost unprecedented. There have been four periods in United States history where we've had money supply contractions, where it's where it's actually been negative o- over a, a considerable period of time. One was in 1948-49. Another was 37-38. And then, of course, the big one, 1929, 19, uh, 1933, and then before that, 1920, 1921. All of those episodes were contracting money supply. And what happened? Well, one, we got the Great Depression. Yeah, depression, 19, yeah. 1929, 1933. Mm-hmm. And the others, we had big recessions. So that means what? That means that next year, 2024, we are going to witness a recession in the United States. And, and, and that is baked in the cake because economic activity is generated with a lag of what changes are in the money supply. So you change the money right. supply a year and a half in advance, uh, and, absolutely, and, yeah. and, and then you see it coming. Yep. So, so I know it's coming. Because we've never had these kinds of contractions with the exception of these four periods I've given you. So we're almost 100% we're going to have a recession. Now, what about inflation? You said it was 3.1% now and falling. Greenwood and I think by the end of 2024, it'll be somewhere below 2%. It'll be below, it'll actually be below the target of 2%. 2%. So, so that's, the, that's the forecast. And and the model is the quantity theory of money, and and, 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 and that 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 again isn't too conducive. Inflation falling below two percent uh, is is deterrent to a, a healthy economic activity. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, falling below two two percent starts n- number one. It's below the target, and yeah. and why is it going to be below the target? It's because the money supply growth rate. Right now, on a year-to-year basis, it's contracting. By the way, three point two percent, and 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 with with that kind of contraction, that's way below the golden growth rate of six percent. That's an unhealthy rate of growth in the money supply. A healthy growth would be around six percent, five or six yeah. percent, like that. Yeah. So what what we, what the Fed has given us here. It's kind of a roller coaster ride, up and then down. Yeah. You know, we up and down, and now uh, now, we're on, now we're on the downside. So, actually, I was just that, that was going to be my next question, follow up question. I was just coming to the part that you know we've seen these policies implemented at two big extremes. First, there was such a huge increase in money supply, and then there's been contraction beyond what is considered normal. Do you think that the Fed is this is this did they have a plan to do that? Or do you think that they're just playing it by the ball? They, they, they haven't been able to really grasp the gravity of the problem and address it in a more uh, logical, rational method. Well, number one, they, they do not use the quantity theory of money. They, they have explicitly rejected it. So they, they pay no attention to the money supply. They're, they're just focused on interest rates. And... and, mm-hmm. and, and as I said, quoting Friedman, interest rates are not a good guide for monetary policy, only changes in the money supply. So they're, they're just looking at the wrong thing. It would be like, let's say you were a pilot in, a, in, in an airplane and, and there was nothing on the altimeter. The only mm-hmm. thing that should be on the altimeter, if you're talking about monetary policy, is a money supply. But the, they, they're not looking at the money supply. So nothing is on the altimeter. Now that that means you're flying blind. In short, to answer your question, they really don't know what they're doing. They really don't know what they're doing. Actually, that they, that's very. They, they don't they don't know what they're doing, and I I think I think what what we will see going forward is that the already the they look they look very much at the when they look at for real economic activity they look at what's going on in the labor market. They tend to focus on what's going on in the labor market. And the labor market 
the unemployment rate's still quite low in the United States, but it's deteriorating. And I think it, I think next year it, it will continue to deteriorate pretty rapidly as we go into recession. But but remember, the labor market's always lagging. It lags behind. And think of it this way: Let's say you're running a business, and and sales starts going down. The first thing you do you you stop employing people overtime. You cut their overtime, and then maybe you would cut back their hours. But the last thing you want to do is actually fire someone fire because you, you have a lot invested in human capital. Ca a capitalist running a business, they, they, mm. they, they, li they like their labor. They've invested a lot mm. in their labor. They've trained their labor. They don't want to fire them. So the last thing to go is labor. And, and that's why the labor market's a very lagging indicator. It, it's the last thing to go. But what will happen as we slow the economy down, the labor market continues to deteriorate. The Fed will see that. And, and eventually, but it'll be too late, they'll pivot and, and start loosening up. Right. But so it'll, dis it'll, it'll all be too late. So basically, despite the fact what the Fed does with the interest rate, they've signaled that they're going to bring down the interest rates. You don't think there's much possibility that it'll impact, uh, you know, economic growth, and you still see that it, it won't generate much economic activity, and we are forcing a period of recession. Yes, yeah, so it'll be it'll be too. They'll, they'll come to the 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 parade too late, mm. and and and, and we're, we're gonna then the, 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 and and when they pivot, they they always go big. So, so they'll, they'll, uh, the, we'll, we'll have another probably increase in the money supply. They'll over, overshoot, and then we'll have a, an inflation problem again eventually. But that, that won't come for a long time because of these lags. Greenwood and I think, by the way, if they continue with this quantitative tightening that they have right now, because remember, they, they say the interest rate, you said it was 5.5% for the federal yeah. funds rate. Yeah. It looks like they probably won't reduce that until sometime after March, after the, the March meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee. So, so that, that, will, that will happen. But the question is, what about quantitative tightening? Because that's, that is really the monetary policy tool that impacts the quantity of money directly. And that, that's, they're shrinking the, the balance sheet. They're shrinking the balance sheet, yeah. and the and that means the contribution of the Fed to the money supply is negative. They're they're shrinking the thing with quantitative tightening. So the question is, well, when when will they stop the quantitative tightening, and and kind of start stabilizing the money supply? It'll all be too late, and what will be happening next year will be all the result of what this monetary contraction for the last over a year we've had. So that's why I say it's kind of baked in the cake. We, it's fairly easy to forecast in general what's going to happen because we know what happened to the money supply a year and a half ago, two years ago. I'm, uh, absolutely. No, I completely agree with that. And uh, speaking of it's all baked in the cake and it's meant to happen, uh, I mean, Great Depression is a very prominent and extreme example, but like, how do you foresee the level of recession that is that you may anticipate in the next year? And uh, how is that likely to impact a common man's life? People, you know, who are viewers who really do not understand deep economic theory, but, you know, they, they do feel the ramifications of all these policies. Uh, how do you think, uh, you know, it, it is likely well, to impact that? It, it, the the impact is tough because uh, n number one, un the labor market will get weaker, meaning there'll be less overtime, there'll be more people laid off and fired, and uh, and and that's bad. Not nothing worse than if you don't have a job, that's pretty bad. And and and, and in in addition to that, uh, it it creates a lot of anxiety it, and and. If people start getting worried about the economy. They, they get worried when the inflation goes up, but when things start going down and, and you actually enter a recession, they get worried too. 
So you, you have this kind of fear factor going on. And if you look at the, you, you mentioned this in your introduction, that the people in the United States are, are anxious about the economy, even now. And, and if you look at the economy right now, today, you look not, we're not talking about the forecast. Right now, it looks pretty good. The economy's going along, growth's pretty good, uh, employment's pretty good. But people, are, when they do these surveys, people are still very anxious about the economy. And they, they say they're not satisfied with President Biden. Mm. The, the, and and there, there, there's this there's this already this huge gap between the way people feel and 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 actually the reality of what's going on in the economy and and there'll be more of that gap absolutely and thank you for making that connection because i was just going to highlight the fact that we cannot help but you know draw the comparison between uh the economy and the elections and 20 next year is the election year and it is really going to impact or influence the way people vote and they think, despite where they may lay on the ideological spectrum. Uh, it's a huge deciding factor, the way the economy pans out and plays out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and by the way, there, there are various theories of the business cycle. Now, the one we've been emphasizing is the quantity theory of money drives the that's the fuel of the economy, making it goes up, goes down, and so forth. But there, there are other theories that are, are relevant and uh, complement the quantity theory of money. And, and one comes from the Cambridge, Cambridge University, the Cambridge School. And, 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 and there, the emphasis is almost completely on business confidence. Mm. So, so, so if we get the quantity theory of money and, and Hanke's prediction that we're going to have a recession and this angst and anxiousness and confidence going down, the confidence complements what's going on with the quantity theory of money. So it, 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 if, if, it, even if you look at Keynes, you look at Keynes, for example, on confidence, even in the general theory, Keynes said he paid the most careful and anxious attention to confidence, where it's the state of confidence. And in the pure Cambridge theory, by the way, the, the business cycle is 100% driven by the state of confidence. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's a key deciding factor. And this is how perceptions are shaped. I mean, it not only influences the economy, it also influences the stock markets and, you know, those top so many different countries that are operating in the world. See, so, look. Look at China, look at China right now. China is a perfect example. It, it's it, depending on how you measure it. If you measure it by purchasing power parity, China actually is the biggest economy in the world. If you if you use regular market exchange rates, the U.S. is bigger than China. But but any any way you cut it, China China is a huge a huge economy. economy. And what's going on there? What's going on is is in fact. If you look at the quantity theory of money, their money supply it has been growing a pretty close to the Hankey's golden growth rate consistent with their inflation target. But inflation is, is below the target. The target's 3%. Inflation's about zero in, in China. Mm -hmm. And the economy's struggling, struggling, struggling. Mm -hmm. now, now, why is that? The state of confidence. The state of confidence. If you talk to any, and, and I'm I'm doing business in China, and 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 I have you know boots on the ground. I, I have people in the field that I talk to. If you talk to them, it's confidence negative, 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 negative. You 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 you. I don't I don't talk to any of my employees in China, and and get a positive response. It's all negative. True. No. Absolutely. So before we conclude, one big question for you is that today it's 18th December, whatever had, whatever policy levers that were employed have been employed. But if they were to rectify the course, the Fed and the US admin, the government administration, what do you think can be done in order to avoid this very uh, scary scenario of, of a large recession coming in the next year and the year after? Okay. At this point, what could be done? Yes. Uh, okay. In 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 short, nothing about the recession because all, mm. all of that happened because of the contraction in the money supply that happened a year and a half or two years ago. 
so 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 the question is well how can you mitigate mitigate it absolutely yeah. and, and to mitigate it i i would do one thing right right today stop quantitative tightening mm -hmm. that's that's one thing and and announce may, may, maybe even in the next federal open market committee which i think is in january uh, cut the federal funds rate so that that that's kind of a signal more than anything else. The quantitative tightening is real. So you stop that and you reduce by, by 25 basis points during the first Federal Open Market Committee meeting of 2024, you, you reduce that. That's that's Those are two things that I would do on the monetary side. And, and I think that would mitigate the problem. The third thing I would do is I would back off of, remember the biggest contributor to the money supply is what? Commercial banks. And commercial bank credit is actually contracting. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's contracting about 1% per year. And, and part of that reasoning behind that is that the regulations, the bank regulations have gotten tighter and tighter and tighter. So I, I would stop the tightening and strangling of the banks. So those are those are three things I would do. No, 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 thank you for highlighting those. I hope that we can, uh, you know, make this message very loud and clear, and uh, the Fed and the administration is able to follow these uh, the, these guidelines that you've laid out. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for your time and for this insightful discussion, and for highlighting what the problem are, what what the problems are, where the gaps have been. And more importantly, what can be done to mitigate the impact of what is inevitably going to be period of recession in the coming year? Well, thank again, thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, let me let me wish you and your guest a, a happy new year. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll I, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be a very happy 2024. <laughs> but. It, <laughs> enjoy it while you can <laughs> thanks thank you thank you for the kind message uh i i hope uh things turn out to be better for various people who you know whose lives very much directly are impacted by these economic fluctuations but again thank but, you so much for your time uh, it was an absolute honor